Most of you know me. I'm Don Kaveny, director of postdoctoral um, review at, at ACOS. Um, uh, I've been there for uh, a little over seven years now, and we're at the edge of a lot of changes in our in our process and our procedures. Um, these, of course, these these sessions, um, people are. Program directors have to attend one of these surgical educator seminars once every other year. Um, normally there's 40 or 50 people at the most. Um, today, for some reason, we have double that. Um, but anyway, welcome. Glad to see everybody here. And what I want to do is to find out who you all are. Um, well, first, are there any RESC members, our review committee members here? I know we have. You one of ours? Oh. <laughs> There's, there you go. There's four or five. I want to stand up just so that then they know who you are. Introduce yourselves and and your discipline. And the, the, the lovely blonde in the back waving her hand with a meek voice. Not me. Oh. Okay. Um, our review committee is made up of 15 people. There are two representatives from each discipline, um, with the exception of general surgery, who has uh, four. Uh, but anyway, um, we have about 80 uh, programs that we, that we approve at, at ACOS, surgical programs. And because they're surgical programs, Dr. Chavon asked me to make sure that everybody left their scalpels at the door and to make sure that you know that they are not ACGME type people. Well, they are type people, but they're not from ACGME, so be gentle with them. Um, but anyway. How many of you are general surgery people, be program directors or, or residents? Okay, the majority, and, and that's what's usually the case. Um, what about CTV? Cardio, thoracic, general vascular? Okay. They know it all already, so they're not there. <laughs> Surgical critical care? Three. Plastics and reconstructive surgery? Neurological surgery and euro. So, with the with the exception of, of vascular surgery, CTV, or was it something? We have a have a, a mix like like our programs are. But anyway, um, how many of you are uh, DMEs, which is our counterpart for DIOs, of which Dr. Chavoni is a DIO of his hospital. Um, how about coordinators? Are there any coordinators here? Great. Uh, thank you. So anyway, um, we're standing at the, the edge of a, of a lot of changes, HCGME, the unification. And we're fortunate because our chair of our review committee, uh, Greg Smith, was appointed by the AOA to be on the Joint Education Committee, made up of three um, AOA types and three ACGME um, individuals. And so they're, I don't know what they're doing, but they're, they're traveling a lot and learning a lot, sharing information, to, and hopefully we'll know better how to shepherd this, this unification. But anyway, Dr. Smith, because he has uh, been in the, in the trenches for the past couple months, um, he can tell us a little about what he's done as far as the, 
the Joint Education Committee and his perception of what's happening with unification. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Greg Smith, I'm chair of the RESC. I'm also one of those three people on the uh, Joint Education Committee from the ACGME. Um, we are, that committee is tasked with basically trying to come across uh, with some educational materials and some information so everybody knows what's going on. Um, part of that process, honestly, in the last couple of months is figuring out what's going on and how it's going to happen. Um, and some of that is things that we might discuss and decide uh, to bring to the people that are sitting in the dark room in Chicago that actually make the decisions. And some of those things are things that the dark room is going to decide. Um, and what I mean by the dark room is there's another committee that um, are the leaders of the profession as well as the powers of ACGME that uh, meet. Uh, they were meeting monthly. Uh, they have ramped it up to every two weeks, and I think that uh, it'd be nice if they met every day for a while, but I'm not sure that's going to happen right now. Uh, they'll get there, um, and I hope that they get to every week soon because there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that are going on. Uh, what we've been doing in the Joint Education Committee is um, trying to, uh, number one, establish a, a timeline of sorts, um, number two, the most paramount thing that we want to do is we don't want to present any information from the AOA or the ACGME that suddenly changes later. So it does two things. When the information does come out, it's going to be hopefully accurate. And number two, it delays the information a little bit because everybody wants to make sure it's correct. So. Uh, I recognize everybody is probably a little antsy. What do I do? What should I be doing? What am I supposed to do? Um, and some of the answers are just be patient still. But that being said, um, certainly um, the presentations today I think are going to uh, provide a lot of insight as far as the ACGME processes and uh, what to expect and how things are structured, which is a little bit different. Um, there are some issues that are going to be worked out, uh, but as far as a timeline, what I can tell you right now is next spring uh, there will be a process started around April, <clears throat> and that process will be sponsoring institution acc accreditation. More than likely, some, if not all, and I can't tell you the answer, Opti's may be able to be your sponsoring institution. That's to be determined officially yet, but that's the process we're trying to get through right now. Um, <clears throat> if some programs have the availability of having a ACGME sponsored program, uh, mm -hmm. Someone mentioned they're from Geisinger. Uh, obviously, Geisinger has a lot of programs that are ACGME as well as AOA programs. A uh, program uh, such as uh, a Geisinger program that's an osteopathic program could use a sponsoring institution that's already there, which is Geisinger. Uh, a lot of programs have that availability already, and you can certainly do that. Um, if that were to be the case, then you can proceed with your application for a program and get pre-accreditation status beginning next uh, July 1st. And for a lot of reasons, what I will tell you is that everyone should strive to get pre-accreditation status as soon as possible. Pre-accreditation status doesn't mean much of anything other than you have a completed application on file. It doesn't mean it's been accepted by the review committee. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It doesn't mean that you're accredited by the ACGME. Full accreditation is what comes after pre-accreditation status. So the, but the important thing is if you get into the pre-accreditation status, then all of your trainees in your entire program would then be eligible for all ACGME fellowships and other programs. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some questions uh, that you all have, but I think let's get to the uh, informational part of the presentations. 
And Don, do you want to do the introductions? Yeah. At, at your uh, places, there were packets, a little bit of information about the surgical educator seminar. Um, I, I put a reading file in your, uh, um, in your packet of information that we've received over the past few months. Some of it's on the AOA, ACGME Unified Accreditation System. Also, uh, let's see, uh, the ACGME Strategic Plan, which just came out, is also in there. So it might give you insight into that organization. And uh, then there's just the IOM report, which just uh, came out. There's an, an information. In and then uh, there's just articles which might be of interest, like the New York Times article on DOs are, are the best thing since sliced bread. But anyway, um, also in your packet is the uh, part of the program, the overheads that we'll be, be using. And they will, again, they'll be online uh, after this, this session. Um, meanwhile, our pre presenters are not ACGME uh, representatives. They are program people just like you and I. And uh, uh, maybe not like you and I because I'm not a program person. I'm an association person. But anyway, uh, Carrie Eckhart, um, I've started for the past few years going to the AHME meetings and anticipating that there's going to be a lot of change in the future. And so those meetings, the AHME meetings, um, have been a real bastion of knowledge. And Carrie was, up until just a few months ago, the, the, the president of that organization. And she's, uh, she's now at Stony Brook before she was um, at UPMC, and we had one of, of our surgical general surgery program um, there that came under her purview. And then Dr. Chavon is, is, um, is a DIO from Stony Brook. And he was fortunate enough to steal Carrie from uh, UPMC, and so they're both from Stony Brook. But anyway, um, here's Carrie and, uh, and Fred. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Um, this session is being recorded, so that's why the slides uh, need to be lit like this. Um, and if you can't see them, you do have them in your packets, but we hope that you're able to see them. So, good morning, everyone. And uh, this is a little bit different format than perhaps you're used to. Uh, we're going to do this tag team type presentation. So instead of this very formal, I stand up, talk to the mic, and then walk away, and then she stands up and walks to the mic, uh, we're going to kind of go back and forth. And as uh, Don has told you, we are the um, users of the accreditation model. Um, and, uh, and also, as you heard, uh, Carrie Eckert is probably the most experienced and probably knowledgeable person in the country in which every doctor and every GME person in the country just wants to hear what Carrie has to say usually. So it's a big treat uh, to have the person that knows most of this stuff uh, since she's, what, nine years old? I think you've been doing this since you're nine, yeah. right? Yeah. So Anyway, so one of the greatest things that's happened is that she uh, came, I don't want to give her bio, but uh, so Carrie started out in Albany and I'm an emergency physician. And I have good friends up in Albany uh, that were the DIO and the, and the dean, both who are emergency physicians. And uh, I kept telling them how fortunate they were that, you know, they get to work with this person, uh, Carrie Eckert, who uh, makes their job basically very easy because uh, uh, she takes care of everything. And that's what you need. You need somebody that's going to help you take care of this whole process. So I'm very happy to see coordinators in the audience because without the coordinators, um, it is an incredibly difficult process. But, um, and then she went off and I was jealous that she was at Albany all these years and we would meet at national meetings constantly. She went off to Buffalo and I, it's where I went to undergrad, so I was even more jealous that Buffalo got her, you know. And then of course the opportunity of a lifetime opens up at UPMC and she goes off to UPMC and I figured, all right, well, we'll just collaborate. And that's what we did. We did a lot of collaboration um, between the two institutions until finally I was able to recruit her to Stony Brook. So she's at Stony Brook for two months and two days. And, <laughs> and uh, so that's why you see that very happy picture in the beginning. Um, 
uh, we finally got to work together uh, after all these years, being that we've been collaborating for all these years, uh, to be honest with you. So what's Stony Brook? Where is Stony Brook? Maybe some of you have heard. Anybody ever hear of Stony Brook University Medical Center? Oh, good. I'm happy to hear that. So uh, it is the diamond in the rough in New York, uh, down in Long Island. You can tell I'm from New York, right? People tell me that. <laughs> You don't have to say you're from New York, Fred. They, they, know. they know. So as you can see down here, it's, uh, it's on the north shore of Long Island. It faces Connecticut. It's about 63 miles from Manhattan. And um, it's one of the few, three major medical state university systems. So you'll have um, uh, Stony Brook, Downstate, and Upstate that have similar models because they all have a medical school and a hospital that they own. Right? So those are, the, those are the, then there are other SUNY State University of New York um, like Buffalo, which doesn't have its own hospital. It has a consortium of hospitals. And then you have um, Albany, which is a private medical school but has its own hospital, right? So you have all these different configurations, and I'm sure you're familiar with many different configurations and stuff. So uh, anywhere in the middle, we just got the largest uh, grant ever in the history of a state university. We got $360 million from a, a benefactor from the state university, and we're building a brand new Mark building. And go to the next slide. And uh, all this new construction, as you can see, um, which will be a brand new research center, a new cancer center, a new uh, children's hospital, a new neuroscience pavilion. And um, so there's a lot of incredible amount of excitement and growth at our institution, um, despite the fact that budget cuts are enormous. New York State has cut all the money to us. We're basically on our own. So despite tragedy within budgeting, growth can still happen. You just have to go out there and seek those grants. And those are really easy to get, right? I mean, you all know that. So, but, um, so what, what are we? We're uh, an institution that's a 603-bed institution. We have, uh, you can see the stats here. Essentially, uh, we have about a $1.1 billion budget you know, for the university medical center type of operation. And uh, having that connection with a hospital and a medical school, I could tell you, really, really makes a tremendous difference, I think, in your ability to make changes and do things within your institution because the two are definitely aligned in a way which is necessary in order to do this job of, of teaching residents in your hospital setting. So uh, where you have that opportunity, I would certainly take advantage of it. So uh, let so you tell about what we're going to do today. Yeah, this is a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, the ACGME history and structure, just a few slides on that. And then the AOA ACGME integration. We don't know how much of this you've actually had before, so we will go quickly through it if you've had it before, if you've seen it. Um, then we're going to play Jeopardy, like the game show. Um, Alex Trebek is flying in, actually, to do it. And um, that will help with some vocabulary stuff that would be awfully dry if we did it as a vocabulary lesson in ACGME. Um, then the next accreditation system, which is what it was called before it was here. Now that it's here, we kind of call it the new accreditation system. Um, the web ads, the web accreditation data system is how you put in data every year. I'm going to show you what some of those um, slides look at, some, what those screens look like so that you'll get more comfortable with that, which will be your, your responsibility. Um, Self-study visits, which are replacing the old-fashioned site visits. Um, ACGME resident and faculty survey that your residents and fellows and your faculty were participate in every year, so make you more familiar with that. The clinical learning environment review um, is an annual review that uh, will take place in each teaching hospital every uh, one and a half to two years in the country, every single one. So we'll go through that. Um, the annual program evaluation, which is required by the ACGME um, as a year in review kind of thing, uh, and the program evaluation committee that conducts that APE. The Clinical Competency Committee, which is where the milestones um, are starting to take hold uh, as a way to measure the progress of the residents through the programs, and the Annual Institutional Review and Program Oversight. So um, <clears throat> while most of you, I think, are at the program level, it'll be important to know what the institution is responsible for in terms of over overseeing your programs. So that's our slightly ambitious agenda for today, and um, we're going to start. So they needed to bring Foley catheters, right? Is that <laughs> no scalpels and Foley catheters. Yes. So as we said, we're not uh, the ACGME. We're not making the decisions. We are working the system uh, very similar that you need to work the system. Yes, we may have a slight advantage because we've been living it, but uh, it's brand new to so many institutions uh, across the United States that have been in the ACGME model as well. Uh, I do need to disclose that I'm a voluntary 
Clear Site Visitor. Clear is you're going to hear a little bit about. Maybe some of you have heard about it already. Um, clinical learning environment is the absolute new change in ACGME mentality and is a huge challenge for all of us because it means changing the culture across the United States of America more than just a programmatic issue. And, uh, but Carrie's not a volunteer site visitor. The, the clear visits are conducted by uh, somebody who actually lives this kind of work every day, like Fred, and, uh, and folks from the ACGME. And um, so it, it's a sort of a peer review process and um, we'll, we'll go through that soon. So it's a mystery. Yeah. So remember, once upon a time, the ACGME uh, didn't exist. It did supposedly had some type of code back in the uh, early 60s, but um, really did not have any type of specific structure. And most of it were groups of special specialists that basically decided what would be how it, way residents would train. Lack of not really much of its standards. And it really was in 1972 when the Liaison Committee for GME was born similar to what happens at American Medical Schools, which was the LCME for undergraduate medical education. And uh, again, it was not as well organized. The structure was uh, not in place. I remember when I first took my job as the DIO, the Designated Institutional Official, um, I uh, uh, looked at the institutional requirements and I kind of smiled. You know, it was a page and a quarter of writing. You know, I said, ah, this piece of cake job. Um, and as a matter of fact, my dean told me when I, get, when I got the job, uh, he offered me the position and I said, well, you know, this is a big job and I'm, we've got to do a lot of changes in this place. There's not a lot of structure and we need to really create this structure. And I said, you know, I was wondering what kind of protected time would I get. So he said, oh, you don't need any protected time. You know, you're an emergency doc. You get paid enough already, you know. So I um, said, oh, well, um, what about 20% protected time? That seems very raised. Absolutely not. 10% is all you need. And I said, well, what about a raise? You know. Um, so he says, uh, really? I mean, we're paying you so much money, and what do you do? Work a couple of shifts a week? You know. I mean, uh, so there's a definite disconnect, you know, from institutional officials. By the way, I did get a raise. I got a tie, um, a Stony Brook tie. That was my um, compensation. Uh, compensation for taking on the job. So it, it wasn't like all of, a sudden, all of a sudden this DIO position became such a uh, profitable position. Um, and uh, really, what, learning about the structure of the ACGME became a huge task. And when I asked my dean, how do, you, how do I do this? He said, just go to every meeting you can go to. You know? Double AMC, ACGME, just go to the meetings. You know? And that's how you're going to get all this stuff done. And that's what I did. So really understand that the ACGME is under the board of structure, and like we said, we're not, we're not the ACGME, and um, you can explain this one better than I can. So, so the member organizations that were actually responsible, um, the parents, the WMC, um, the Association of American Medical Colleges, American Board of Medical Specialties, American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, and the Council of Medical Specialty Societies are now the board members um, of the ACGME. <coughs> So that is um, the oversight body. And there are bylaws and there's governance, um, but the important thing is that there is a specialty review committee for each and every specialty. Um, colorectal surgery, for example, is its own specialty, um, RRC. And um, the requirements are at the institutional level, and we're going to go through this a little bit later, but there are three sets of requirements for every program. And that would be the institutional requirements that relate to how an institution is supposed to conduct itself if it sponsors GME programs. Um, your specialty specific requirements, and then also the common program requirements. So duty hours are the same for all specialties, for example, so they fall into the common program requirements. So it's just a little bit about the structure of ACGME. But the power sits in the RRCs, and that's where the flexibility comes in, because no one knows what each RRC is going to then decide on some of the language as this whole process evolves. And um, RRCs have the ability to go have different requirements across different um, uh, RRCs, the resident review committees. So understand where we're at in GME. This, there's no question that this is across the United States. We have hospital systems that live with Joint Commission and live with uh, the Department of Health and live with all these regulatory agencies that dictate how they need to operate. And uh, we have the GME world, which really was and. Uh, the ACGME and educational programs, and we look at competencies, and we look at uh, uh, you know the pyramid of uh, of way to get to be a competent physician, 
And those two things, they, they never speak to each other. They just never spoke to each other. On Joint Commission, anybody familiar with Joint Commission? Okay, so, <laughs> obviously. How many times do they ask the doctors anything? No, the doctors say, oh, I'm really busy. You know, I gotta, I gotta take care of this patient, right? So in the joint, and if you don't do that, then you're kind of foolish, because you, you have that ability to do it, right? So, um, so there never was that kind of model that brought these two together. And this is really, the time has come really to align ourselves and uh, bring the hospital and residency training programs back to Earth, you know? Because one lives on Mars, one lives on Venus, and they never spoke to each other. And this is the biggest challenge we're facing and what's being forced upon us a little bit by this new ACGME uh, accreditation system. So um, that's where I think we're in this a little bit at the, at the new point together because of the fact that this was never the case before. So you heard a lot about the governance already and the MOU that's out there. We could just tell you that two days ago, the ACGME just posted on its website a little bit more detail that has what was the, in these slides. And we, um, sounds like you already have this information, right? Uh, they're going to be uh, a much more collaborative effort where uh, there will be appointment of AOA members to the RRCs. Uh, those uh, resident review committees are where the, where the power and where the decision making is going to be made. You can even see the numbers that are going to be assigned to each one you know, what that process will be, who, de who decides on who those nominees and how those nominees get onto the RRC, uh, puts you into the power. There will be new ACGME staff uh, the, for osteopathic accreditation, the executive director position. You probably have more information on this than, than we do, right? So, and, and this is public, so you can announce this stuff. You know, I'm not saying anything that's not yet been determined. So, obviously coming under with this one big structure, and the review committees are really where, like I said, the powers are for all these various different areas, common data systems, logs, um, <coughs> milestones, and uh, where those apes uh, came from. And you're gonna learn, it's gonna be fun to learn all these different nomenclatures, right, so. Really fun. There will be two new um, osteopathic committees. I'm sure you know the Neuromusculoskeletal Review Committee um, will be appointed, uh, five nominated by the AOA and appointed by the Board of Directors, one appointed by the ACGME Board of Directors, and the Osteopathic Principles Committee. Have you seen all of this before? Do you know the MOU pretty well between the ACG and the AOA? I don't think they have. Okay. okay. Um, so in addition to the uh, RRCs that already exist for orthopedic surgery, general surgery, internal medicine, neurology, there will be these two new review committees. So in the structure where the review committee is responsible for these things, um, education, writing requirements, revising requirements, um, conducting site visits, um, the, the assessment tools for the milestones, um, there will also be two committees for the AOA. So these will be um, added to the roster of ACGME committees um, within the next year. And then the timeline for accreditation, I think that we touched on this already, but July 1st of 2015, programs can begin applying. And that's a five-year window, so as many times as it takes, um, if you don't get it the first time out, there's no penalty for applying again and again. Um, so the window, it'll be over the five years going from July 1st of 15 to June 30th of 2020. Um, the only caveat is that programs, of course, have to be sponsored by an ACGME accredited institution. So um, many of the opties are already working with the ACGME to see if their structure fits that of a sponsor institution. Um, and then I mean, we recently went to Michigan and did a presentation like this, and the opti in Michigan, which is a statewide system, I'm sure you know, is attempting to get accreditation, uh, uh, sorry, sponsoring institution status so that it can sponsor the programs, or alternatively, Henry Ford Hospital or some of the ACGME uh, sponsor institutions already can sponsor their own local programs. So that still um, remains to be seen, and not all opties are structured the same way, so I don't think it'll be one answer for every opti, but you'll make those decisions locally <coughs> as to whether you'll be under the umbrella of either an existing ACGME accredited sponsor institution, like Stony Brook, we have osteopathic programs that we will start to sponsor locally. Hopefully. Um, hopefully. <laughs> um, Michigan, which is a statewide opti that may do it, or an osteopathic um, hospital that applies for ACGME accreditation as a sponsoring institution are probably going to be your three choices. You want to add anything? No, I just got a question. So do you see a benefit if the opti or the institution sponsors the program? Do you see, looking in the future, do you see that one would be more beneficial to the program than the other? Um, the answer that we have given and that we've heard is actually, why not do both? So if the opti is going to apply for sponsoring accreditation status, 
even without programs to sponsor, it would be good to have both of them set up that way. So that right, Henry, right, but, one, but, one, but your program has one sponsor, right. right? So if Henry Ford Hospital, for example, is one of the um, sponsors in Michigan, um, since they're already in the business of sponsoring ACGME programs, it's probably an easier route since they're already um, doing everything the ACGME needs them to do. They, they actually just had a clear visit, Fred conducted that clear visit. So um, they're already you know, in this business. Um, if the Opti does it because there's some statewide economies of scale or you know, some, some other knowledge base that is good for the programs for Michigan to do, then I, I think that the Opti would be the better choice. One of the things we're trying to focus on is what's best for the residents, you know, as opposed to what, what, what is in the best advantage. And you heard it already, going with the pre-accreditation model in a sponsored institution that already exists is basically going to be pretty seamless, it sounds like, based on what we've seen so far revealed. That means if a sponsoring institution like Stony Brook now sponsors the osteopathic program in surgery out of Southampton and Peconic Bay, that's where our surgery program is, those residents instantaneously then is able to do a fellowship in any ACGME accredited There's program. No so the benefit becomes to that re to those residents. And, and I don't know, if, I can tell you that in our in the ACGME world, as we track the stats of surgical graduates, because of duty hours, because of all these restrictions, because of the changes that occurred over the last 10 years in, uh, in uh, educational modeling, uh, almost everybody's doing a fellowship. There's not, there are very, very few um, general surgery residents that are not doing some type of fellowship after their five years of training. So really, if we're gonna look at it from a benefit perspective of what's in the best interest of our, of our candidates, of our, of our residents, uh, we wanna give those the opportunity to do those fellowships and get into the uh, advanced programs without any bias at all because uh, of the different systems that exist. Yeah. Uh, well, if the ACG, now, yes and no, because the RRCs have to still respond back to the uh, ACGME, um, and that's where the little dark room discussions I think that you heard about uh, are going to be happening. So there are a lot of rumors out there, a lot of rumors, a lot of myths, a lot of stuff getting thrown out. Um, it's uh, so hard to tell, uh, say, what would be the um, final determination when they haven't revealed it yet. So uh, there are going to be lots of uh, uh, rumors flying, no question about it. That's why uh, going to these national meetings, I think, are key. Um, AMI is you know, going to bring out the head Nasca and John Potts and uh, Tim uh, Brigham. Brigham. <laughs> you know, and you'll see them at the ACGME meeting. You know? And then really hearing it from, if you go to the society meeting, where the society is having their, and I'll, not to be pejorative, but you would call it the stitch and bitch sessions, you know, about all the, what's going on, you know, and why this stuff is, why they're doing this to us. It's not gonna be the same message as going to the ACGME meeting, going to the Army right. meeting, going to these other organizations. And I think that's um, what we're all kind of waiting for. Um, my, my goal is to move forward with uh, assisting in any way possible to bring sponsorship for the surgery program from Southampton to Peconic. You know, we can, uh, I, I believe that that would be a, a seamless thing, but I uh, haven't had discussions with NICOM, who's the opti for the New York, Long Island area and stuff like that. So you probably know these people, so I can say that pretty transparently. We just haven't gone yet and made those kind of um, back room discussions yet. So that's our, that's our mission. Our mission okay. is to do exactly that. That's, so what, when I leave this meeting, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna go out to Southampton, I'm gonna go to NICOM, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna have these kind of discussions and see what we can and can't do. So. Is, is there already a, a mechanism for this pre-accreditation application that? We we're gonna show you what they just released two days ago. On Thursday, so. they, they put this on the website for the first time. Um, yeah. One Just one, one question. How does the funding of the residents, how, where does that stream through as far as institutional sponsor? So understand it doesn't matter if you're osteopathic accredited or ACGME accredited. Uh, CMS pays whatever that uh, IME, DME dollars are to that institution. Those dollars stay in those institutions. C CMS is Medicare. Yeah, Medicare. Yeah, I know. So it does, it, does, sorry, yes. it does not matter if your institutional sponsor is an opti, that funding will still come to your hospital. Goes to the hospital. Yes. That's the way it's set up it, now. The IOM Medicare. made some recommendations. I don't want to go into the IOM report, the Institute of Medicine report, but that, 
No, but then I, I think we will need both. A little bit that I don't believe any of the IOM recommendations are going to come immediately to fruition, especially in an election year type schedule. So things like that uh, we need to follow with other organizations. But the reality is the money stays at the hospital. It doesn't matter what the accreditation process is. I think the only important differentiation is that Opti is very expensive. Yes. So you're going to be spending extra money if you accredit through an Opti rather than doing it through your own right. institution. That's the other consideration <coughs> in choosing your sponsor. So, uh, uh, yeah, you were. Uh, um, I know. In, in the choice between an Opti and the sponsoring institution is going to be basically whatever provides the program with what they need what to they be fully about. accredited through that institution. An Opti is going to provide an opportunity to pool resources. And one of the things in the, one of the, things in the IOM report specifically was talking about uh, economizing and streamlining and become a more efficient graduate medical, medical education uh, system. The, one of the things that's a process of what we're doing from the Joint, Commission, or Joint Education Committee is we're actually seeing the benefits of Opti. And Opti may be a process and a system that may be expanded to include all C ACGME programs. Because take, for example, just a, just a, just a, yeah, just a, take, for example, Chicago. It, it, you have a whole bunch of programs, and they all have their research centers, and they all have this, and they all have that. It, it would be a lot cheaper if there was one research center for all those programs. So that's kind of the opti concept. So the issue then becomes, is it cheaper, is it more efficient to do it in that manner? And that's one of the, the things that's actually ongoing in the <coughs> currently. So opti provides a resource and an opportunity in, in, in Time will tell whether it's valuable. Thank you. So, you know, that, those are still open for sure, right? So here's what the pre-accreditation status is really what's important to ACGME is that these things now become that structure. And that, that's the requirement to be pre-accredited is that you have this structure in place. It's a little bit of an easier pathway because it may not require a, a site visit, for example. So it could just be declared by the application process itself. So again, that's a pathway decision and financial decision that you're going to need to make. But, and we're going to go into what these things mean as uh, we go on. So. OK, so the pre-accreditation status stays in effect until the program receives an initial accreditation or until June 30th, 2020, or the program withdraws the application. In some specialties, um, there are small enough complements of residents that programs may combine. So it may be that um, while they still look the same structurally um, in OBGYN programs in Michigan, for example, they may combine it under one sponsored program so that they can meet the minimum critical mass of the uh, number of residents per year. So the ACGME really is going to help uh, the programs who apply for initial accreditation. There's going to be a lot of feedback. If they don't initially get the pre-accreditation status, they will not be given a withhold status, which is what the allopathic programs have been vulnerable to, um, and they'll be given guidance and improvements necessary for accreditation. And you do have a lot of allopathic colleagues who are able to help you navigate this um, if, if that's what you need as you go through this process. And again, can reapply as many times as necessary for the five years. So where will the help come from to do this? Definitely from the ACGME itself. Um, they have, uh, over the years that we've been doing this, become a much, much more um, customer-oriented organization. Um, I remember calling the RRC for medicine and asking a question. I had searched everywhere, high and low, for an answer. And when I called, th there used to be a green book, which was an actual book that was green. <laughs> Every year was a different color green, but it was always green. And when I called the RRC for medicine, he said, look in the green book. And I said, well, that, I, I think that I would have already done that if that was supposed to be my answer. So, um, but they become much more user oriented and they want us to succeed. And you know, there's no reason that you won't find the same thing. So the central GME office is going to be critical to your success, I think, in navigating this, um, and um, AMI. So um, I probably am a little biased, but um, <laughs> the uh, Association for Hospital Medical Education, ha actually every other year used to sponsor an AODME, a joint conference with AODME. Um, and so we've always had osteopathic members in our ranks. We have lots of jointly, um, jointly accredited programs and program directors who come to our meetings. And um, this year, we are doing more and more with the um, osteopathic community in our national meeting, which is in San Diego in May. So certainly look at the AMI website for resources and for colleagues. 
um, there's a message board you can post any question that you need to about this and people will answer it. So that's central office, staff, and how they work is also essential for the success of each program. And uh, having that DIO or the DME that becomes a DIO based on that pre-accreditation status uh, really is key to be able to have the success of what's needed, what's that oversight, and it's going to be led by the charge. So going to the ACGME webpage is actually quite useful because it has a lot of this information on it. Uh, you can see over here on the left side, they just released the single accreditation system approval program uh, information two days ago. Uh, you click on that little play thing that says click here. And, um, and uh, what it does is it, we're not on, online, that's okay. So, so that, that I think that's really important. And then what you can see on the right side is as you go through and you want to find things within the specialty, um, you see there's a drop-down list that drops down on this right side over here and um, will help direct you. All these things are all the various different RRCs and underneath each one of these tabs is a multitude of information about what are the requirements, what do you need to do, what are those FAQs uh, about explaining some of those requirements, why do they ask for these kind of requirements, because many of you will look at these requirements and say, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what are they thinking, right? So these FAQs are really out there to try to help guide those kind of principles behind what's there. And it's all buried in this website. So when I couldn't find things either, I called the RRC, I called these guys in the web ads, and I said, uh, where do I find this? And they said, well, you're the DIO, right? And I said, yeah. Isn't that your home page on your Explorer when you open up Explorer? <laughs> Not really. Well, I said, should it be? You know? And I said, <laughs> of course. That, I mean, you should be, that should be your home page. Every time you open up, that's all you see. So my recommendation, if it's not your home page, you know, they expect it to that's what they expect. And uh, the other thing is that the FAQ, since the requirements are only going to be updated every 10 years going forward, um, so it's not always a moving target, the FAQs will be where the dynamic sort of organic stuff happens. So you really want to make sure that the FAQs are something that you look at if you need an explanation as to how call from home is counted, you know, and the duty hours and, and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of interpretive stuff in the FAQs that are on the page. And again, this just came out on, um, the, on the 18th. So on Thursday, um, was the first time that we were able to see any information um, that was um, that was new since uh, July, which is when the memorandum of understanding was agreed to by the AOA and the AACOM. Um, this is actually what you get when you click on that. If we had a hyperlink, you would have seen it happen live, but this is a screenshot of it. So the single accreditation system for AOA approved programs. And on the right hand side, if you can't see it up here, um, education, application process, the timeline, what the process is going to be, news and communications, and then as we said, the, the FAQs. And it says, these FAQs address common areas of the single accreditation system that results from an agreement between the ACGME and the AOA and AACOM. So um, you will see that this is where you'll go for that kind of information, and it'll be updated as there is more information. And, and it's, not, it's said, not in your handout because this came out after Thursday. we already sent this yeah. out. So anything that happened after Thursday is going to be something not in your handout. But um, the three sets of requirements, again, are the institutional requirements um, and the common program requirements and specialty-specific requirements. So those three documents will be important as you go forward into the ACGME. Um, are there any more of those handouts yeah. um, Don, do we have any more? Hours? Hour slides? slides? There, there's some around the table, so after, after it's over, um, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. He's been boarding them. Oh, they found some. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's go to Jeopardy. And um, what do we, uh, we weren't sure what the setup was. We didn't know if there were tables or groups and stuff, so. We're going to do this by show of hands, and uh, we asked that the Michigan people not answer because they already got the answers to these questions. Uh, so. <laughs> Jeopardy two. So, let's see how many people are familiar with Jeopardy. I don't know. <laughs> no, there's no audience. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to have these categories. Alphabet soup, to work and not to work. Who am I? Are you competent? And uh, we'll just uh, start. We can either go around the room, which uh, is the way we work sometimes when we have 124 medical students and we do this. 
Uh, or um, you can show, you can all raise your hand. You can tell us which one you're at. I think we should go around the room and just put you all on the spot. That's probably the best thing to do, right? So a table at a time? Yeah, a table at a time, right? Okay. So, so the first table. You guys, you guys are a team. Every, ta every table becomes your own team there. So pick a, pick a category and a mount and we'll go through these things. To work or not to work for 200. Okay. <laughs> so remember our focus. So nice and clear. So That's after the system. It didn't work. What? New accreditation system. Right? Yeah, do they go cool. by new or, or next? Whatever it is. You can't go backwards. You we'll yeah, you it. can. But that went into the wrong category. It clicked on the wrong one. I did. To work or not work for 200. That's what I clicked on. I know, but it's... Let's, let's make sure our thing is working right here. We can use the other one if it isn't. <laughs> Yeah, so on top of it, so. Yep. For 400. Oh, that's for 400. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'll give you that one, too. We'll take it. So what is it? Uh, what did you say it was? Clear what is, is uh, yeah, new accreditation system, or next, and clear is clinical learning environment review. Wow, bravo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the, uh, use the other one. You're right. I didn't want to mess that one up. Oh yeah, what is right? You guys, team. Yeah, you have to do it in the form of a question. That's okay. Yeah. Yep, my team members covered me. It's okay. 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 We're going to. That was just a practice question. That was a practice, oh. right? So. so now we're going to actually okay. do. So here's a real question. To work or not to work for 200, the maximum duty period length for first-year residents. I think you said it in the form of a question. <laughs> what is 16 hours? And that is correct, so <laughs> you guys have been looking at this stuff, huh? <laughs> Very good. Right, next table? <laughs> you guys, next? Category? I'm out. Are you confident 200? They like the 200 one, I think. Residents must demonstrate a commitment to carrying out responsibilities and an adherence to ethical principles. So which of the competencies is that? The same competencies for AOA and ACGME. You on the sixth competency? I think you have seven. What is professionalism? What is professionalism? <laughs> <laughs> and people say, I don't know what professionalism is. See, right? How many times have we heard that? In regards to those duty hours, um, as we go through the accreditation, should we start switching over from our typical 24 to 16 now? For interns? I think so. Yeah. Um, Why you're not? going to be accredited by the AOA until such time you reach full accreditation through the ACGME. So there's going to be a transitional period, obviously, where you're pre-accredited but still getting accredited through the AOA. Right. There is a mo There was a motion presented by someone in this room mm -hmm. at one of the big meetings of the glass cluster to say that we need to probably get approval to just ignore the differences and one or the other is going to be okay. That hasn't been approved by the board, uh, <coughs> board of directors of the AOA at this point, but I assume that it will be. I would think that it will be, and if it isn't, then we have a problem. But so the answer will be it probably won't be an issue. I can tell you it's very interesting now as a fallout of surgical residents in particular. Uh, when we went to the 16 hours for the interns, the seniors were angry as could be. Angry. Seniors were angry. How, these guys are a piece of cake, you know, I work my off and uh, these guys are getting away with murder because they're only working 16 hours, they should be working 110 hours like the rest of, uh, I mean 80, because they don't always say the truth on their <laughs> duty hour reporting. So, surgical, in the surgical field, more than any other area, uh, there's already been a tremendous resistance to these duty hours. I happen to be from New York State, I don't know if you ever heard of New York State, uh, Libby Zion. And uh, who started this whole thing? Um, and uh, in our state, it's a law, so uh, it's beyond just the um, uh, you know the uh, ACGME guidelines or requirements. It's the law, and we've now had a resident prosecuted for violating duty hours in New York State. Criminal. So criminal. So um, 
they, they're taking this duty hour stuff pretty seriously, despite the fact that many, many of us, particularly surgeons, are incredibly resistant to this. Well, Frank Lewis is doing a whole we, We've had the requirements the for almost 30 years, so yeah, it's not, not a bad idea hours. to start being in compliance with them. So that's, uh, so that's you know, there's <laughs> a tremendous resistance. Yeah, let's keep going, so. The third table? You've had a long time to think about what category you'd like. Oh, I keep thinking it's our, our laptop. It was a touch thing. <laughs> Residents and fellows must be able to provide care that is compassionate, appropriate, and effective for the treatment of health problems and the promotion of health. Nope. Where's the mouse? <laughs> Where's patient care? Just, you can read, all right. <laughs> Back to that group. The whole there. game. All the answers. All right. You can't touch Next it anymore. Next table. I'm, all right, I'm going to touch it. I was supposed to be the Fourth manipulator. Fourth table. Are you confident for 300? Residents and fellows must demonstrate an awareness of and responsiveness to the larger context and system of healthcare, as well as the ability to call effectively on the other resources in the system to provide optimal health care. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. Systems based practice. Systems based practice, all right. So do you think this one's easy to do? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely not. This is one of the biggest challenges we have within our residency training programs. Getting the residents to understand how to work the system properly for the benefit of patient-centered care, et cetera, et cetera, and get beyond just my operative skills. You know? so. Next group. No? Which one? Alphabet Sue? They like the 200. ADS. Well, I may be mentioned it once today already, but just once. It has a web in front of it. Anybody, anybody? Where you're going to submit your information through reports. So what's that called? Uh, what is... Yay! Somebody very quietly said it over here. Okay. So what is the accreditation data system, which is web as a web-based system with critical accreditation data for all sponsoring institutions and programs, and serves as the communication tool between programs, sponsoring institutions, and ACGME staff. So since it's web-based, it's available all the time. <coughs> and what's new for us is that it's not just an annual update, it can be updated all the time. So when you join, uh, your, when you, your programs are putting data into web ads, you will always have the ability to update real time every time something changes. When a faculty member has a new publication, for example, you'll put it right in instead of an annual update. So I understand that this is also a problem, right? Because um, uh, we got this thing now, it's cycle lengths, 10 years. Uh, our orthopedic surgery program has got a site visit coming in 2024. And the guy says, I'm doing the happy dance, right? I don't have to have these guys come for 12 years, right? Except now they have to do this constant download. Constantly. So, you know, it's a whole new world uh, for seeing what's going on within the programs based on this ADS model. How do you get access to it? Where do you need to register? As soon as you get that pre-accreditation status, they send you the link to the You'll have uh, a username and, and, and a password. password. And Go to town. And then it's welcome to web ads. Yeah, so. The next group? Well, I heard, sorry, uh, that you need to do that through the ADS, the application. Yeah, well, the, the sponsoring institution starts the process. Oh, okay. So I, as DIO, start the process. I put it into web ads. That gets approved. And they send you the link to getting an ID and password for the system. So. Okay, next group. <coughs> Next table. I've never heard of shy surgeons. It's impossible. for 200. Thank you. <laughs> the organization that assumes the ultimate financial and economic responsibility for a GME program. Some people are whispering it. 
Anyone? What is? CMS. No, not CMS. We'd love to put it all on them. <laughs> they just fund it. What is the sponsoring institution? That's, okay. that's what defines the sponsoring institution. We have all that responsibility financially and um, educational and activity. So. Next group. I think we're the last table in the back. Second. Second to last. Individuals invited to interview for a training position in a residency or fellowship program. <laughs> this is in here for a reason, but you know the answer. What is the medical student? <laughs> it's a good answer. It's not the answer, but it's a good answer. <laughs> Most of the medical students don't jump into oh, fellowships. Well. So. <laughs> okay. All right, so that's what you call them too, but there's a reason why we're giving you this yeah. term. Because there are responsibilities associated with it. And it's a applicant. An applicant. Right. Very good. So the reason this is in here is because the ACGME requires, and I'm not sure if this is true for the AOA, but that you give the terms and conditions of employment to the person before they actually accept the, the interview. So before they spend $1,000 to fly to Stony Brook for an interview, they need to know clearly that you're going to offer health insurance, disability insurance, what the salary is likely to be, even if it's a year behind and you don't have the new salaries yet, they need to know what they're going to be provided with should they come. Is there a living allowance? Is there subsidized housing? Um, you know, what, is there health insurance included for the family for free? So that information has to be available on your website. It doesn't have to be sent um, on paper, but it ha you have to be able to make that available to people. And an applicant is defined as someone invited for an interview. And many, many allopathic programs get this wrong. So that's the reason it's in the yeah, Is there an equivalent of, we have AOA opportunities where all that information is listed. Is there an ACG and the equivalent of AOA opportunities? It's not necessarily it's opportunities. It's institution by institution. But institution will dictate what their, what their um, um, no, I mean, the institution dictates it, but we have a common place where all our program directors enter Wait, that information. No, and, that uh, doesn't um, exist. shop around, they have a common source. It's, that's, it's from sponsoring institution to sponsoring institution. So then it's already taken care of in the AOA program. Great. Because it is already there. Yeah. Great. Great. But it doesn't exist in ACG. No. No. It's, uh, it's at the, because it's very specific to the institution. I may, I may not give you, um, uh, you no, know, there's benefit. location pay. We're saying it is specific, so we enter a specific Yeah, there's just a clearing it's house. Yeah. It's posted right. on gotcha. the website. No, that doesn't exist. We don't have shop around right. there with all that information. Right. Um, I got it. Sorry. Right. It's, it's uh, you know, for example, in, in uh, at Stony Brook, there's a location allowance, a location pay add-on that wouldn't exist in some of the other, in the Syracuse, for example, SUNY system. So it's, it's institution by institution. And it's actually program by program. If ophthalmology, for example, at our institution gives a $500 book allowance or CME allowance, that's there specifically to tell the candidates. And we couldn't even collect all that information to give to them. It's actually when you're inviting applicants for interview. So it wasn't a trick question. It was a more <coughs> complex answer than you would think. Next group, is there anybody left in the back that didn't get a chance to choose yet? Or are we up here? OK, we're up here. To work or not to work. I'm nervous. <laughs> the minimum time off between scheduled duty periods. A little bit more than that, but you're right. Must is eight hours. I mean, should is eight hours. And must is eight. Must, I'm sorry, must is eight and should so is ten. So it's just to allow for travel time so that you have some eight hours to sleep. If you're uh, given ten hours off, you have a better chance of doing that. And this is really problematic as people put their schedules in place because they do clinic and uh, conference and anything that you require them to do counts. It's not just time in the OR, you know. So that's where it gets a little complex manipulating that schedule. And moonlighting counts as well, right? That's right. So many programs don't allow moonlighting for residents. And moonlighting has to be pre-approved and then counted afterwards. Yes, next row. Okay. They're all going for the big box. Again. Do you see a cursor? Yeah. The group comprised of the CEO, the CFO, the CNO, the CQO, the CMO. Well, we call it a little coin term. So if you see it, you'll know what it is. 
We're the members of the C-suite. <laughs> and they recently coined the D-suite as the dean's office, uh, the dean of the medical school's um, office as well. But so the C-suite is what you'll hear. We just want you to know what it is. That but this is where that alignment comes, getting back to Earth. So we've lived in that GME world so far away from the C-suite that now the new requirements are forcing us to work closer with the C-suite. That's the only way we're going to be able to meet the clear initiatives and meet those other uh, new requirements within Which the is actually a good thing because the DIO used Absolutely. to be the only mouthpiece for a lot of these requirements and it stopped with him or her. So now the C-suite, it's incumbent upon them to support um, the GME mission and the accreditation standards in a way that it wasn't before. Yeah. So who actually bears the full responsibility of the quality of the learning environment in the hospital? According to the ACGME. Huh? Board of trustees. Mm, specifically a one person. CEO. The CEO. That's brand new. It's brand new. Now it gives the power to the DIO and a power they've never had before. Because now it's the CEO's responsibility to make sure that learning environment is right, meeting all these requirements, not just some poor doc over on the side that has no authority over the hospital practice. And then the and clear visits, that's who they meet with the first, the first person they meet with and the last person they meet with right. is the CEO. So that, that's a great empowerment thing. The next group. Well, what's the DIO? You might as well use it. <laughs> The cursor disappears if you don't keep playing with it. I know. Okay. Next. The mouse. Next table there. Any? Who am I for A physician in a program of graduate medical education accredited by the ACGME who has completed the requirements for eligibility for first board certification in the specialty. Boarded in one specialty, pursuing another. What is that fellow? I don't think we have to talk much about that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next table, next row. Okay, residents must demonstrate skills that result in the effective exchange of information and collaboration with patients, families, and health professionals. Which, which competency? Excellent. Interpersonal communication skills. Very good. So that's a key one, too, because there's a lot, a lot of attention now going on about handoffs, transitions of care, new requirements associated with those things that are changing the culture in most institutions. Next group. Anything? Anyone? All right, how about are you confident for five months? <laughs> <laughs> Residents must demonstrate the ability to investigate and evaluate their care of patients who apprise and assimilate scientific evidence, continuously improve patient care based on constant self-evaluation and lifelong learning. She knows what that is. Anybody? Practice-based learning, practice learning, learning and improvement. Don't forget the improvement part. That's another huge new Focus. Okay, where are we going next? Okay, just I'll just go there. No, I can't. Uh, the All right, table in the back. Second to last table. Pick a, pick one. All right, how about the minimum time? <laughs> we already did that. Alphabet soup for four hundred. Okay, good. Oh, that one we did oh, already. Oh, we already did that one. All right, so because it came up. Came, I know, I know. Wrong. Yeah. All right, so we just go back. All right, how about 300? Sure. Okay. CCC? <laughs> Excellent. Clinical Competency Committee. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Which has to have at least three faculty members, a written description of their responsibilities, and you have to review all resident evaluations semi-annually and then report the milestones to the ACGME and in their advisory to the program director. So it is recommended that the program director not chair this committee, um, but that this group be advisory to the program director. There's a nuance that is just now coming to light. All right. We're going to do alphabet soup for 500, Alex. Okay. Uh, SWAT. 
So nothing that Totally not ACGME driven, but it's something required. Strengths. Excellent. So you, you need to use the SWOT analysis for self-study and program improvement. So we'll go through this, but over the 10-year cycle, there has to be a SWOT analysis done at least once a year of the individual programs, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay. 300. The maximum duty period length for upper-level residents and fellows. Six. What is 24 hours? It varies a little. In New York State, it's three for sign up. You can't have more than three, and across the country, it's six. In 2003, when the ACGME finally caught up with New York State, we can say that because we're from New York, but <laughs> so it took from 1987 to 2003 for there to be national duty hour standards. It was quite a long wait. Um, but they uh, had decided that six hours was the sign out time instead of three. In New York, it's three. So we have to pay attention to whichever is most restrictive. All right, let's do this one, okay? To work or not to work, for 400. Mandatory time free of duty for residents and fellows. An hour? <laughs> 15 minutes? Be back in 15 minutes? Coffee break, 15 minutes, that's it. One day in seven, right. And we usually... Um, what is one day in seven free from all educational and clinical responsibilities averaged over a four-week period inclusive of in-house call? but doesn't include a call from home. And the way that works is that if you have a schedule that goes from Sunday through Saturday, Sunday through Saturday, you can actually have the Sunday at the beginning and the Saturday at the end free, and you can be on call from home all of the intervening days and still be in compliance, because one of each of the seven days, uh, seven day blocks is free. <coughs> okay. I'm just begging to be at. Individuals who have received formal assignment to teach resident and fellow physicians. Faculty. What is faculty? What is faculty? And that's going to come up too as far as who can who be are faculty. The faculty. Who are faculty? We're going to talk a little bit about core faculty and who counts and who gets surveyed when the ACGME anonymously surveys faculty. So let's see, alphabet soup for 100. DIO. You did this one? So how many Italians in the group? I'm just curious. Italian? Italian? <laughs> what does it mean? Italian. So what does that mean? What does it mean? <laughs> God. God. Not a bad title to have. So, you know, we, we had a lot of discussions at the ACGME meeting, and there was a proposal to change the title name. And uh, there was this flurry of resistance from the, from the audience saying, do not touch that title. <laughs> do not touch that title, okay? That's not a title you want to give up. You put God in charge, and you get things done. You know, that's kind of how... Pe people ask Fred, you know, who gives you the authority to make that decision? He said, I do. I do. <laughs> So the individual who, with the GMEC, you do have a, a board you have to answer to, must have the authority, responsibility, and administrative oversight as per the institutional, common, and specialty program requirements. Huge mantle of responsibility, so you deserve that title. To work or not to work? The maximum number of hours that a resident or fellow can work per week. That one's easy, right? Easy. In surgery, it's 110? No, I, I'm 80. I'm... <laughs> what is 80 hours? That's um, per week. Yeah, so that's uh, that one you can't average. Frank Frank Lewis is doing a study now at the American Board of Surgery and uh, has this ongoing um, uh, study going on for a year with those that are medicine uh, and surgery. Medicine and surgery, but Frank Lewis is in the surgery side, so uh, we'll see if it has the power to be able to make any real determinations if the outcomes are going to change or not change based on these duty hours. But obviously, tremendous. Tremendous uh, controversy across the United States on duty hours, and we can't even go there, so. Okay, double jeopardy. So the uh, categories are coming to terms with the ACGME. It's that time of the month, and the answers to that are um, a month of the year that something happens. It's not an OBGYN question. Yeah. <laughs> clear and NAS. <laughs> now that you know what clear and NAS are. Questions that relate to those. So let's start again over here. I don't know, month for a thousand. <laughs> match day. Residency programs receive NRMP match results. What is February? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's the other match. Oh, yeah, I think it's later. It, I think it's, it's like later, too. <laughs> March. March. What is, 15th. <laughs> what is 
what is March? The these are, yeah, these are just. It March. used to right. be the Ides of March, but they now. It's right around St. Patrick's. Day. I mean, around St. Patrick's Day, exactly. So we That's because the, there's a soap now in the match, so you do match, and then there's a second match. So there's, uh, they changed the timing and the dates of that, so there's a little bit different nuances to the match. Uh, I'm guessing there will be one match eventually. Yeah, I, I think so. Right? Okay. Next, anybody? Anyone? Clear for 600. Okay. Mm. Infrastructure of CLE, how integrated is GME leadership in the clinical learning environment? How engaged are residents and fellows in the clinical learning environment? How to determine success of this GME integration? And what areas or opportunities for improvement have been identified? What is this collection What's of questions? What is, the, what is the? What is the? Well, what are the questions that are asked at the clear visit, right? So we have to, you have to be able to answer these questions. And uh, obviously, they look for the programs to give the C-suite information regarding these questions. So how does that involve programs? It involves programs by feeding up that information to the C-suite. And they're pretty clever. They ask the residents these questions. They ask the C-suite these questions, the faculty and the program directors. So there's a good opportunity to find out if everybody actually does know what's, uh, what's going on in the institution and whether they agree with each other. Next. NAS for 600. I'll be the first. Thank you. Make her, we're gonna yeah, make her the thank you for coming after. today. <laughs> Deadlines for milestone assessment summaries submitted to ACGME via web ads. And we all know what web ads is now, right? The web accreditation data system. So what are the deadlines? Very close. And in December. Right. In December. December and June. Right. Exactly. So you, you download those milestones every six months. So. That should have been a time of the month. <laughs> should have been a time of the month. <laughs> so let's go to time of the month for 800. The Eris post office closes to prepare for the next Eris season. Eris is the electronic residency application service. Very close, May. May, the end of May, very good. So if you want to archive all your data, you want to make sure you have that available to your own institution. Right. Now that Eris is web-based, maybe it won't. And now it's web-based. 85%, 80 80% of the programs went web-based this year. Yes. It crashed on the first day it opened, by the way. <laughs> and medical 50. students were freaking out. It crashed they couldn't on apply to all their programs the first day. Coming to terms for 600. A written document that specifies faculty and their responsibilities for teaching, supervision, and formal, evalu formal evaluation of residents, duration of rotation, <coughs> educational content, and policies governing the rotation. This is no different for ACTM. Mm -hmm. so, so this is your PLA, the Program Letter of Agreement. And uh, these are the details that need to be in it. So when you send a resident out to another institution, these are the required elements within that PLA, uh, Program Letter of Agreement. It's not an affiliation agreement. They got rid of the master affiliation okay. agreement. It's just program to program. That's what is required now. So it's who's going to teach, who's going to do the evaluation, um, in what time frame they're going to do the evaluation, which is one of the most important things, the duration of the rotation, the educational content, and which policies will govern, the sending institution or the receiving institution. But no lawyer is going to let you make an agreement with another institution without them getting involved. But that's their issue, right? What's required for the ACGME is the, the educational component. Okay. Let's see. Let's go to NAS for 800. So the ACGME first self-study visits begin for programs. When does this happen with 12 months notice? We told you orthopedics is like 14 years away. But <laughs> when will the first Every ones occur? Year, so. July 2015 is the first time that they will start doing self-study visits, which we, we haven't had any of them yet. So. so what's great is like, as we don't know what's going to happen with this uh, AOA, um, ACGME details, we have no idea what they want with the self-study yet. You know? So um, we're all sitting here waiting to see what the details. We know there has to be a SWOT analysis. But outside of that, we really don't have much information, so. I picked a category. 
uh, the six main focus areas that CLEAR will assess when evaluating sponsoring institutions. Have you had any familiarity yet with CLEAR? So patient safety and quality improvement, um, not that they have never been uh, included in requirements, but they are definitely the focus of the CLEAR visit. Transitions of care, supervision, duty hour and oversight, and fatigue management and mitigation, and professionalism. So these are the six areas that they look at when they go to do a CLEAR visit, like Dr. Schoen did when he went to Henry Ford Hospital, talking to everybody uh, that you meet, except for patients. They're the only group that actually is not yet questioned by CLEAR visitors but about the initiatives for patient safety and institution, for example, quality improvement, transitions of care, and the others that we've had for a while, but the first two, the first three are the first time they've been focused on in a site visit. All right, but they've been concentrating on medium and large institutions, and January 15th, they will be starting with small institutions and small programs, single programs, institutions. So if you have a, already and one of those that are duly accredited, you'll definitely be having a clear visit come after January. Let's do a little more with CLEAR. Updated documents required for the CLEAR visit. This is a very long list. <laughs> yeah, so mostly probably not think, familiar Claire? with this. But uh, this is what uh, the institution prepares and probably would help from the program because the program needs to know what policies are going on in, the pro in, the, in each of those programs. The institution needs to know what the programs are doing. So. Uh, the GME organizational chart, where GME sits in the hierarchy of the institution, supervision and duty hour policies, system-wide patient safety protocol and quality strategy, the an last annual report, and any residents who are on committees. So the ACGME has always had as a rule that residents have to be on every committee that either deals with patient care or education in the institution. So not every resident has to be on a committee, but every committee that exists for these two reasons has to include residents, which I think is a darn good policy an advocate for residents. So a clear visit, how long do you think it lasts and how much notice do you think they give? Three days, two weeks. That's close. That's, very close. That's really good. So, you know, medium to large is uh, three days, small institutions are two days, and they give you three weeks notice. It's not supposed to be like the old-fashioned site visit where you had months and months to do nothing else but this or your life re revolved around preparing the documentation. They still say it doesn't really affect anything. Well, that's correct. The right first now, one is formative. Right now it's a formative evaluation. What's going to happen afterwards? Like what we're doing, talking about, right? Are these institutional reviews or especially specific? See, but they, these are involve everyone within the institution. So it's not specific to the, for the um, specialty, but the specialties all participate in it. So you'll have all, you know, you need 60 residents from all programs in the institution, 60 faculty from all faculty within the different programs, and 60 program directors. So that's their model if you have that many people. So and then if, uh, what they expect is every program director and anything smaller than that, every faculty, core faculty member, you know, that interacts with residents if it's smaller than that, et cetera, et cetera. So it does involve all the programs. It's just designed in an institutional format. So it happens every 18 to 24 months? And that's what we don't know yet. What happens with the second clear visit? You gave, it, you gave them the formative evaluation, said, okay, this is what we found, and then they come back 24 months later, 18 months later, and they're going to want to know what you do. And we don't know what the end consequences will be. We don't know how that will affect the institution, but they're certainly speaking about uh, the fact that this will have some impact on is that sponsoring institution able and capable of training residents in that particular environment. Uh, that's probably where it seems to be going. Maybe in five years, but no one's really made any declaration about that yet. Okay, I clicked on this one. What do you think these five documents represent? <coughs> Med so these are the guys who advise Congress. Mm -hmm. 
So these are the Institute of Medicine, the Macy Foundation, the MedPAC, uh, Robert, Robert Wood Johnson, Cogni, National Cogni. So why did they change the accreditation system? Why is this all happening? Because of every single one of these reports say we have a broken GME system in this country. So it's not because the ACGME said we're going to do this. <laughs> not the impression I got. It's because if they didn't do something, if they didn't do something, we didn't make a system that the public and Congress is satisfied with, at risk of losing the you know, $9.8 billion that flows to hospital systems for um, training doctors and um, someone like OSHA taking over everything, you know, or the OIG. So you know, if they so. wanted to stay in this business, they to evolve. So, so that, that was going to be the consequence, you know, you know, from what we hear in terms of the changes. <laughs> yeah. Three, eight. It's one, there should be a one DIO or DME per sponsoring institution. That's their, that's their role. Each hospital might have site DIOs as you go through, but if you're under one sponsorship, it would be one person responsible at the sponsoring institutional level. So it could be one person at the corporate level under that's all the other hospitals are under that one person. If that's the structure for your sponsoring mm -hmm. institutional model. So, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine not having site DIOs or site DMEs, you know, working under the sponsor. The umbrella, especially if it's an OPTI with several hospitals. Right. Let's do coming to terms with the ACGME. Annual accreditation data system update, ACGME resident and fellow survey, case log and clinical experience data, and board <coughs> pass rates. Mm, nope. Close. More than that. <laughs> Annually. Annual update. So this is annually every year you're doing this. So the reason that there is so much of that is that it um, replaces the site visit. It replaces the in-person. So this is sort of ACGME becoming your online dating partner instead of your actual live-in uh, spouse. <laughs> So everything that your online profile is who you are going forward, and it lasts for 10 years. Um, so annually, you're required to update your profile. Back to the DME, there is DME nomenclature in ACGME besides the DAO. It could be the same person? It could be the same person. And there's no requirement that a, D, that a DIO be a physician, actually, either, which is another misunderstanding. There are MBA DIOs, there are PhD DIOs, um, and probably People without those credentials. So the but DME probably has to be a physician, right? Yeah. No. That's your. Not, unless that's your rule from the yeah. AOA, but it's certainly not from our accrediting perspective. So the annual summary for faculty and residents, which includes publications, number of presentations, grant activity, and teaching responsibility. The required scholarly activities under the new accreditation system. So actually this is a, a blessing a little bit because people don't, n never understood what counted as scholarly activity and now this has been clearly defined. So you'll see that in a second. Yeah. Okay. That time one. When does the ARIS post office open allowing programs to download residency applications and supporting documents? If I gave you this answer before. On crash day. On <laughs> the day it crashed. <laughs> was the day it opened, which is this month, which is oh, September. 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 Just opened. Just opened, September Just opened. 15th, right? Okay. The NRMP residency program rank order list certification <laughs> deadline. So if the match happens in March, when do programs have to? Oh, February. Okay. <laughs> so this is around Valentine's Day, and then the match is around St. Patrick's Day, if that helps you remember those. The relaying of complete and accurate patient information between individuals or teams and transferring responsibility for patient care in the healthcare setting. Transitions of care. Exactly. Okay. The 
framework that we'll use to measure and evaluate a resident or a fellow's competency and performance at different levels of training. And these are the milestones, right? Milestones. You got it right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> these are the I, milestones, right? I heard right? them say it, that's all, yeah. <laughs> that time of the month, when do you orient new residents? That's why this is the $200 question. <laughs> June, June, July. Okay, and then the last question, required members of the Clinical Competency Committee. Faculty. Three faculty. At least three faculty. Not good. chaired by the program director. And the program director. No. The program director can be on it, but can, can't yeah. share it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't share it. And they don't recommend residents sit on the CCC committee either. Because it's a, it would be a peer be review process. Program evaluation. Absolutely. They have to be on have the, to be on the PET key. committee, but not on the CCC committee. So people ask me, uh, what are the members of the PEC committee called then? Are they really PECers? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to tell you in a minute. That's a great question. Exactly. Give us a few minutes. So what is the final Jeopardy question since it's not? All right. So I can't do the final. So uh, final Jeopardy question that you should all be aware of would be, where is the next ACGME meeting? And when is it? And we hope to see you there. It's the end of February, and it's in San Diego. All right. And so who doesn't like going to San Diego? It's a nice place. I sh we strongly recommend that, obviously, that this is a meeting that people might want to go to, that uh, specifically to hear the RRC uh, perspective directly from them, and to hear the overall <coughs> theme of what is behind the thought processing of all these issues. Um, Tom Nasker, as um, someone that is the CEO of the ACGME and uh, I think delivers an incredibly clear message when he speaks and it's really actually quite worthwhile to hear what's behind the thought process just like we can't deliver because we're not the ACGME but so all right okay. so let's uh, let's keep going I know you guys are probably sitting there dying and that's why I told you you should have fully catheters but uh, <laughs> we actually are way behind on our schedule no, so okay. We're okay on the schedule. Uh, okay, so the new accreditation system, the way we viewed it was actually a celebration of change. Um, uh, how many of you have ever had uh, a loved one in the hospital? Let's just say. Anybody ever been in a hospital that somebody you love really care about? Not, not just a friend, you know, but somebody you really care about. Yeah. So how many of you feel that you didn't have to advocate for that person while they were in the hospital? Any of you not need to advocate for that person whatsoever as a physician? I think your usual line is when you say, okay, have, have a good time in the hospital, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> Send mom in two weeks, all right? Just let me know how she's doing, you know? Right? Nobody feels that way. So why is that? Why, why is that the case? Why do we feel, as physicians, that's really important for us to advocate for our loved ones? You know there's gaps in care. Absolutely, right? So we know this, there's gaps, the system is broken, we have severe differences in the way processes happen, access, home care, What's going to happen to my family member? Are they giving them the right drug? So when we talk about patient safety and quality, it's not an add-on of work and other responsibility that needs to happen for our residency programs. It's about living the way to change so that when you can go to the hospital and feel pretty safe that mom's in the hospital, I don't have to worry, I don't have to sit there and advocate for everything they do. And these are the kind of things that they found, just as we were talking about this whole change in the accreditation system, the competencies of physicians had to go beyond just particular skills of pathophysiology or clinical skills, particularly surgical skills. It was more about an entire essence of why are we physicians, what do we need to do for our patients, how do we advocate for our patients, how do we assure the systems are in place, and, and how do we know that these things are happening? It can't just be the gestalt method that we've been using for all these years. They needed to be specific measurable outcomes and ways in which you can measure that there are actual improvements going on, safety measures in place, ways in which we can actually show that we make a big difference. And by instilling that training into our trainees, we're going to develop and create physicians of the future in the 21st century that are going to meet all these criteria needs for our patients and for what it is our essence. So most of the time we hear a lot from our physicians that that's not my job. I don't do that. That's not what we do. You know, that's, that's the social worker's position. That's that. And that's great if you have interprofessional communication teamwork that is constantly in contact with each other. But the problem, as we've seen the broken system, is that people don't speak to each other. They don't work within teams. And the, and the system falls down by the wayside. 
Um, nothing like having an intern go in and tell the patient one thing, the senior go in and tell them something else, a consultant comes in and tells them a totally different thing, and the attending comes by three days later and <coughs> totally says, oh, who told you all that stuff? None of that stuff is what we were talking about. So that, that is where the, the epitome of the broken systems are. So it really, really, the ACGME and what the new accreditation system has said, you know, you guys have a chance to innovate and do things differently than what is proscriptive before. You know, ACGME was very proscriptive uh, before this new accreditation system. Every single I and needed to be dotted and T crossed, and if you didn't do that, you got cited, you know? So what they're saying is, yeah, we're still gonna have some minimum, minimal, Minimal requirements for you. This is the bottom line of what we expect from your training programs. And what you're going to do is be able to innovate. But let us know what you're doing. How are you innovating? What's going to be different? And how are you going to measure whether that innovation is actually going to benefit or be better for the program, the training, the education, or the outcome? So The other thing is that it used to be a one-size-fits-all system. So whether it was a program that was in very bad shape being visited you know, on a one-year cycle or a program that had a five-year cycle, it was one-size-fits-all. So the documentation was the same, the questions were the same, the duration of the site visit was the same. And so this really does promote um, good programs differently than it does um, programs that actually are in, are in worse shape than that. So now it's a 10-year self-study visit every year. Um, every program is required to do an annual program evaluation. This is conducted by the Program Evaluation Committee. And we'll go into this in a little more depth later. But the requirements of it are resident performance, opportunities for faculty development as um, gauged by the faculty's satisfaction with those opportunities, graduate performance on the boards, how the current residents are doing in the program, which is resident performance, the program quality that they are anonymous and confidential evaluations of the program by the residents and by the faculty, and then a documented improvement plan. So when you did this thing a year ago, what did you say that you were going to improve and did you improve it? So this is what every specialty will do going forward and they hope to see ongoing improvement um, and they will give you 12 months notice as this shows um, where you're going to do your last self-study visit before they actually come. You're going to do your self-study internally before they come for their site visit. So this counts by the way as faculty development in case you were wondering, right? So, so what, what's it going to look like? It's a continuous cycle, constant improvement. Um, they're going to revise these things, as Carrie said, every 10 years, and, uh, uh, but they're going to take into account other things, too. Now, who, they, our residents have a lot of voice um, on how things are going. Resident surveys, faculty surveys. The ACGME is going to take into complaint complaints, too. There's a process for which residents can bring things up to the accrediting agency. It's got to go through the DIO office first, and then the DIO office either fails to deliver or satisfy what those concerns <coughs> are, and then they bring it up to the ACGME level. So it's just not willy-nilly. And anonymous complaints don't go anywhere either. They usually need to be very specific for action to occur. But public information, things that are on your website, things that happen, um, institutional quality and safety metrics, these all come into play when the ACGME might decide to come and do a special visit. We'll talk about that in a minute too. So what's this new accreditation system in a nutshell? 10 year self-studies, institutional review, that's going to happen in parallel as well. We don't know when that's happening yet because they haven't announced it. This is also a 10 year cycle. There are absolutely no guidelines on that yet. <laughs> Um, we know a little bit about the uh, program self-study visits, but nothing at all yet about the institutional. Common theme, right? You're, you're starting to hear that theme a little bit? <laughs> change is rough. So, um, and then the clear visit. And the clear visit, I think, is the most substantial <coughs> change because they're dedicated every 18 to 20, 24 months to come back every single time and really look at these things. So here's those annual inputs, as you can see. These are the areas what's going to count the most. Board pass rate, for example, a lot of weight. Can't pass the boards, it's not your resident that's the problem, it's the program that's the problem. That's the way they view it, right? Uh, these milestones reporting is, still you have that ability to decide where your residents are at, but what really they're gonna be looking at case logs and experiences and what defines a pr primary surgeon versus uh, a secondary uh, surgeon or assistant surgeon. So, and, uh, and then those ADS uh, updates. A lot of programs think they could just continue to put the same information up each year, and that's erroneous because what they're looking for is where are those improvements, what's changed, et cetera, et cetera. So and we're going to introduce it to the resident and faculty survey and the kinds of questions that your residents and faculty will get. Thinking about the, the web ads, do you typically in the NCGME world have the program coordinator constantly do it? Do you have people sign <coughs> data entry in a large institution like Stony Brook? 
that just do the data entry for the web, web ad? The coordinators do it. The, the deadline just passed us September 5th for most specialties. So um, the coordinator will put in everything that is new. Um, and we'll show you the way the screens look, actually, for web ads. Um, for example, you put in the PubMed ID numbers for each faculty publication. And that's something that he or she will look up and enter. And then um, the narrative parts of it um, are where there's more interesting information. So any um, major improvements that have been made, major changes to the programs. And then it's really helpful for the GME office, the central office, to look over those submissions before they go in. So that we, you know, some, you get lost a little bit sometimes and you don't pull back the lens enough and say, but we just built a new children's hospital or, you know, we, just, we had a new program director in the last 12 months and that doesn't get mentioned. So it's our job to kind of look at that overview. So it doesn't get signed off by the DIO before it gets submitted or anything? It actually... Well, it does because what we did... That's optional, but that's optional. what we do. That's but we, we, I couldn't imagine not having that oversight. So we instructed all of our programs, do not hit submit until we could see it and evaluate it. And our staff, our mighty staff, as you're going to see in a minute, <laughs> of, of uh, GME people that we have uh, actually reviewed every single entry into, into the web ads. And we made significant, I think, recommendations and helped with changes. Our, our role was facilitative, not punitive, you know. None of them went in unchanged, in other words. So. So. We did have comments on each question. Board. Yeah. yeah. Whose boards are they even looking at? Because ABS, is, if the MOU was dumped on ABS. They have no idea what they're going to do without allowing DO graduates to sit for ABS boards. So whose boards are they probably talking about? That's back to the black room, you know, so. Uh, dark room. <laughs> dark room. Um, I, you know, to answer that is uh, premature at this point, so. Unless, is there an answer? The MOU does not address anything regarding boards. <laughs> That's the party line. Yeah. The, the, the boards are an outside issue and are not on the table currently. They're an outside issue, but they're a central part of validating the program. So sure. I'm not sure how this can go forward without... Oh, you're asking about how they're going to... Yeah, they're going to... There's going to have to be some kind of methodology and that's being determined how the DO boards will be integrated within the system. Just don't have a definitive answer yet. That's all. But there will be. And the but there will be. There will be. Just it. like we don't know what the self-study is going to look like. It, 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 yeah, nobody, I mean, there's lots of issues that go into that because of uh, a lot of the osteopathic programs are, are, are smaller programs versus some of the other programs on the allopathic side. So the rolling averages and the percentages are also going to have to be different. It's a whole complex system and methodology they have to get through to be able to figure out how it's going to be incorporated. And I know there's been some discussions about it. I don't think that any decisions have been made at this point. But when that, I mean, that's kind of one of those things at this end of the spectrum of things that need to get done. There's things that are at the other end that'll be done before that. So don't expect an answer probably right away. We have small programs too. I can tell you, you have two fellows in a program and one fails it, you're way below any criteria. So our, our, our goal is to 100% void pass rate, period. I mean, it's very, I know it's hard to say that, but you, you have to strive for that. Yeah. What happens at the State University of New York where they have that consortium of hospitals? Is there somebody at SUNY that is responsible for this? Is responsible, like, is there a DIO at SUNY that oversees this information in before it's submitted? That's sort of a, a buff, in Buffalo we have that model. I, I worked in Buffalo um, after being in Albany. And um, the there's one DIO who's responsible for the whole. Um, for all the hospitals. For all the hospitals. But, the, but each individual hospital is responsible for, for example, the clear visit. So if um, Erie County Medical Center had a clear visit, the DIO would go from the medical school at Buffalo to participate in that site visit. But She's not an employee of that hospital, but so the hospital, it's incumbent upon the hospital to answer the clear visit questions and have the clear visit. And then um, Buffalo General Medical Center would have its own clear visit, you know, and, and that's how that would go. The Catholic Health System, the VA, they're not doing VA hospitals yet, but they will probably in, in eventually en envelop them. So do you have a residency program that would be at multiple institutions where the program, uh, program director sits at SUNY? The program directors um, in Buffalo sit in hospitals. hospitals. So they are under the auspices of the DIO, and there's one GME committee that gathers them all together, but, um, but they actually live in each individual hospital. So you, you, for example, internal medicine works in three different hospitals in 
Buffalo Erie County Medical Center is where the program director's home office is, where the residency program in internal medicine lives. Okay. Does that answer your question? So you don't have any programs that, like a consortium of, of a program where you might have, uh, let's say, a general surgery program at Buffalo and Albany and something else, that okay. their residents go to all of that. If, and if you did, you would have individual site program directors? Well, I'll be honest with you, Wash U probably is the one that is most spread out uh, geographically, eh? from Montana to Utah to Fairbanks, Alaska to Seattle. Um, In West Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. I'm talking about the uh, University of um, Washington <clears throat> out in, in um, Seattle. Uh, Seattle, Washington. So there, they have a structure that is probably quite complex. And so how do they do this? I don't have that. I, I would love to give you that answer, but I'd have to call the DIO over at the... Uh, I would guess that Skype helps a lot <laughs> <laughs> in trying to manage those geographically diverse. I think that we learned that um, Alaska, there's an Alaska program that's under the auspices of the West Virginia Opti. Is that correct? So that, that's pretty uh, geographically distant. The ACGME frowns on geographic distance under one sponsoring, well, under one program. So um, Albany and Buffalo, for example, are 300 miles apart and would not be able to co-sponsor a program. So they do expect there to be, you know, 20 or 30 miles is different than 300 miles for the ACGME when they sponsor a program. So they do expect you to come back for grand rounds and some program events that you can't possibly come to if you're 300 miles away. Yeah, that's because you can't have a resident go from Albany then next month to Buffalo, next month to Virginia, next month to Rochester, Mayo Clinic, you know, and be under that one type of program. It would be. But if you had one within like 10 miles of each other, where would that program director be responsible to if it's all under SUNY? Would they report then to SUNY DIO? Their yeah. faculty appointments are all through the medical school. All right. So, so the, you submit that information? That's at the local level, program director and coordinator sit down and do this together. So it's the program director that's, that's responsible and the DIOs and the GME office oversight before they submit it. But one person, that would be the program director of that consortium, you know, would be the responsible body to upload it. When to I all, worked, the, to all the different hospitals. When I worked in the GME office in Buffalo, we were housed at the medical, center, medical school, but I was on the road all the time. So I would go to the children's hospital, I would go to the VA, I would go to the Catholic health system, I would go to Erie County Medical Center, so I would always be um, on the road so that we were in touch with the, the, the local programs. Who paid for the gas? Me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the GME okay. office really becomes a, what was the ACGME. I mean, that's where having that oversight is really important, doing what exactly Carrie's talking about as far as going place to place to place and, and really being on top of what's going on. Uh, we're traveling constantly now between Southampton, the VA hospital, our community hospitals around us as we're building our own type of consortium and hopefully um, bringing on board as many of the osteopathic programs throughout Long Island. Uh, so just to add to what you said, does the hospital then pay uh, SUNY for the residents and for the program director and for the coordinator? That's the other way. So um, the money flows into the hospital. Because it's a Medicare add-on. Medicare, so the Medicare pays the money. hospital. From those IME and DME dollars, that's what a funds flow model goes out to support program director surgery, for example, you have to have thirty percent protected time. You know, it's built into the requirements. So how do you how do you assure financial and protected time for thirty percent of your time uh, as a surgeon? You know? But then how does the hospital individual hospitals will pay pay the program director? It depends yes. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, it, and there's so many different models. Uh, we have great consultants. If you want to talk to us privately, we can help you with the financial model, but we're not the financial wizard, so. But there are great consultants out there that are doing this now as we speak. Yeah. But in a place like Buffalo, where the medical school really is separate and it really is the, <clears throat> the hub and the hub and spoke system, funds actually flow from the hospitals to the medical to school the medical to support school. the salaries of the 12 GME staff. That it, it's about an 800 resident system. So that's how the um, programs get supported at the central level. Yeah, because the medical school doesn't get any money for GME Not you know, at from all. the government. So, so then we really, when the new accreditation system came um, into place, we really did become the oversight body. So we became the site visitor. We became the over, oversight body for all of the programs, even more so than we were before. Um, and because it is an annual look at these programs at, at least, um, and not every three to five years like it used to be. So oversight is being redefined. So that's where the DIO comes in. And uh, I, like I said, I embellished this title. Um, 
when the guy says, who gave you the authority? You know, it's the, uh, you bring the tablets down from uh, the mountain. So uh, we oversee in, uh, the uh, annual evaluation, the annual downloads, all the duty hours stuff. We have a, a person that just looks at duty hours. We use new innovations, for example, as a uh, database management, as MedHub, as eValue. I'm not, uh, I have no financial ties to any one company, but not doing it, we're doing it without some kind of database system is going to make it very difficult for the most part. So having that kind of thing in place, having a database manager that works, that oversees the entry, entrance, uh, the duty hour, um, we can set tabs so that anyone that enters anything into the schedule that violates a duty hour pops up and you can see it immediately, that kind of stuff. So, and then it's up to us to decide whether or not we are going to go to the program and do a special review or a focus review, depending upon what we find by all the data that we're going to collect. And to think that we can only do those five things that are in that annual program evaluation bottom line apps requirement would be kind of short-sighted because if we're going to spend all this time going to our programs, we want to know everything that's going on within that program, not just those five minimal bottom line requirements. So you'll see why that uh, evolves into a much more um, uh, involved type of uh, review of all overseeing of all the programs. So. I would say that the milestones are going to dictate to you how do you know with 100% confidence that where you're going to put that person in your milestone, your evaluations are being able to give you that information. If you're relying on Gestalt and global evaluation forms that they, and, and use the halo effect that everybody's a five out of five, uh, you're not going to have much confidence. So it's going to, I think it gives you the ability to dictate what should be those forms. There's lots of good recommendations uh, that are out there and that's what every educational system uh, conference that I've ever been to, people coming and telling you what works for them as far as how do I evaluate somebody with confidence and as far as me being able to tag that to a milestone. Because before it was just Gestalt. Oh, he's a really nice person, really nice guy, does really nice, can't, Best resident we've ever can't had. suture, but he's a really nice guy, <laughs> you know, we don't want to do anything, we'll just keep him going, you know, get him through the program and help him out as much as possible because he's a really nice guy. <laughs> But there are no um, standard requirements that use a certain tool to determine a certain competency. So um, you have to, when the milestones came out, I, people started to use them as their evaluation tool. And that isn't that. It's, it is actually the report card that gets generated at the end when you take into account all the other assessment methods that you're using. And there are very few really standard tools. The mini CEX is used in internal medicine as an observation of a, one interaction. But most of the other specialties don't have standardized tools that they use like that. Surgery is using skip checklists, you know, for example, you know, in terms of are you covering everything on rounds, things like that, you know, in terms of your patients. So there, there are some national models out there, but nothing that's prescribed by the ACGME. And this was one of the ways that the ACGME tried to loosen up a little bit, is that they've now broken their requirements into either core requirements, outcomes, or details. And if you have shown to be in compliance with most of the core requirements, then you're able to be innovative um, and recommend different ways to be in compliance. Um, I'm sorry, if you're in compliance with the outcome requirements, you're able to be innovative about the core requirements. But this is the first time that they've ever broken the requirements into these um, different areas, and um, it's, it's brand new to everybody. And you'll just see that in parentheses when you go through the requirements, whether something is core or outcome or detail. So one of the main reasons for the new accreditation system is that about 80% of the programs were actually doing everything they were supposed to do. And they were sucking up as many resources as those programs that weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So the 15% of the programs that were either on probation or um, an accreditation with warning status and withdrawal of accreditation were getting less than their fair share of the attention that they needed to get better, to improve. So one of the reasons for the new accreditation system was to focus on um, the programs that needed more help. So what you download, if they like what you download, you're done. You know, and you go to the next year, you stay green the whole time. That's, that's the key. And it's only then those 15, 20% of the programs that they're going to probably concentrate on as they see these downloads information. Uh, the key is not to be deceitful in your download. That's basically where it comes from. But that's, our, that's what we do then at the GME office. We're the overseer, and the responsibility falls on the GME office. So. 
So yeah. Can you just say something about your GME office? What do you have? Uh, I saw that picture, but you want to go to how that? How many uh, residents do you have total? Uh, how many residents do we have? Yeah, that this staff looks after. Yeah. So this is our staff. Six hundred residents. Six hundred and three, depending. You know, we we also have dental residencies over our jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and uh, we have about um, uh, sixty-five programs. And we try to, we, we, at Stony Brook, it's, uh, we're different than most other programs allowed out there. We don't l really allow anything that's not an accredited program. So only accredited programs are permissible within our institution. They could be accredited by various agencies, ACOG, ABOG, um, the uh, Minimally Invasive and Bariatric Surgery Society, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they have to have some type of oversight accrediting body that accredits at those fellowship level. programs at a national level in order to... BA from, but we have jurisdiction over all those as well and oversight. So we treat any program, no matter what it is, equally as an ACGME accredited program, regardless of their accreditation status. And this is it. This is our staff. Um, it's not big, but it's small and mighty, as you can see. Um, we're probably one of the smallest staff um, that I know for the size that we have, and we do probably one of the best jobs in the country. <laughs> just bragging. But none of these are coordinators. These are just these are GME offices. These are people that work for me uh, under the GME office. Now, of course, we do have a coordinator just about for every program. And uh, some small programs share coordinators, but the coordinators are the essential components of the ability to do this work. And, and one of the things Karyaka has brought to our place, which is just phenomenal, is a, uh, a coordinator professional development program for all the coordinators. So that coordinators are now on a regular basis, monthly going, um, they've, uh, we're striving for a thing called TAGME certification, even though it doesn't really have the strength or anything in an HR world, but it does force those coordinators to become very knowledgeable about their specialty area so that they can recite these requirements just like a program director has to. And really being knowledgeable about what they are. And instead of being secretarial staff, and I don't mean to use that negatively, but they become now part of this problem solving group. So it's the program director coordinator that really is the key to the success of this. And I believe the coordinators bear the absolute um, responsibility and uh, actually uh, the pleasure of because that program is doing so well, it's because they have that kind of coordinator and stuff. So and we, we investing really in a coordinator is hard, is, we, is really important. We really try to do the same agenda that we would do with the program directors with the coordinators so that they understand the priorities that are sort of current. They have the vocabulary, they understand um, what's important and they understand why it's important. Question, when you say you have program coordinators that share programs, how does that work? In other words, I have three fellowship programs. They have, um, you know, one has five fellows, another one has three fellows, another one has four fellows. So that person will spend 20% time with this fellowship, 20% time with that fellowship, 20% time with that fellowship. You know, realizing that so many of these requirements are basically all the same across all the programs is just whether or not it's surgical, medical, you know, uh, primary care, ambulatory. So uh, the, the they're, actually they're um, the right same. online. If, if what they're doing for one program, they're doing for the other program, they're doing for another program. My ideal model is like you have a large department like medicine, they have nine fellowship programs. You know, do not have your coordinators doing um, you know, personal work for the physicians and uh, scheduling patients and collecting data information off and of the labs. And billing and, and that kind of stuff. You know. GME specialists are, are unique. So well, that's, a, that's a great model. We're not there yet, I'll be honest with you. We still have some coordinators that half their time is dedicated to the personal needs of a physician and half of them are doing coordinator work. So, you know, it's... But in surgery, we have general surgery, colorectal surgery, the plastic and vascular program, they're all under one the coordinator. same coordinator. Really? Right. Yeah, yeah, so one coordinator does all those. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of residents. Um, yeah, but the, she's full-time. She does nothing the, else except the coordinator. The usual ratio is about 30 resident FTEs per coordinator FTE. That's generally what people, and that is sort of before the new accreditation system, but the general ratio is about 30 residents makes up a full-time. Are there ACG requirements about uh, a dedicated coordinator and yes. also um, minimum number of residents? In general surgery, there's one coordinator required for the first 20 residents. And then it doesn't get more specific after that. It says additional FTEs have to be um, considered if there are more than 20 residents in a general surgery program. So some of them just say adequate and sufficient, which doesn't help us at all. And some of them actually have specific numbers, like a ratio. And that's RRC dependent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same thing for coordinator. It has to be dedicated one coordinator for general surgery, or you can 
You could definitely share. We, we do. Nothing, nothing that says dedicated. They just say you have to have a coordinator. They don't say dedicated coordinator. Okay. That's the yep. difference in the language. But they want one person named. Yeah, what, what you would do in web ads is somebody needs to be named who is a coordinator, regardless of how many programs they are coordinating and stuff like that. But there has to be a named person who is a coordinator for each program. And it could be the same person for several of them. And certainly once that skill set is developed, it, it does make sense so to have... If they have 10 or fewer residents each, I would guess, because the ratio is one coordinator for 20 residents. Should be so. under the same sponsorship, though, I would assume, is what you're saying. Yes? A hospital has two separate freestanding programs. But one sponsor, two separate it's programs. It's an MD and a DO program. No problem. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. Yes, you could. Yeah. That's probably a better model than any other, also. So now we're going to tell you a little bit about web ads. We've talked about it um, a lot so far. We're going to show you the actual screens that will come up when you go into web ads to do your um, data update. So there's program information that's updated every year. And again, this is real time now, so you can update it more often. Um, resident information and faculty information. So what makes up your core faculty? This is defined within the requirements. Um, doctors, you have to be an MD. I'm sorry, you're, you're a DO. <laughs> Didn't mean to say that. Physician. You meant to physician, say physician. Physician. You have to be a physician in order to be a core faculty. That means PhDs and other uh, nurse practitioners, other areas don't count in the core faculty. Um, some RCs allow them, obviously, to still teach and, and supervise, but they, they, they're not considered core. They can be listed, they can be included in CCCs and PECs, but they're not core faculty. Right. So those that spend 15 or more hours per week working on the residency program in any capacity whatsoever, it doesn't have to be just Velcro to the hip or, um, you know, preceptorship that's direct, right? It could be administrative, it could be uh, didactic, it could be teaching, it could be bedside teaching, research, etc. And then they have to fill out that uh, scholarly activity. So they have to have a certain amount of scholarly activity, and we'll define that. So examples, physician works in department, reading images with responsibilities, includes clinical supervision of residents, member of the clinical competency committee, runs simulations, helps write resident curriculum, bam, you know, perfect core faculty member. Physician scientist who spends most of his time conducting clinical outcomes research with only four weeks per year of clinical time, he counts too. You know, that, uh, that, that's a, no problem. Who's not a core faculty, you know, would be a physician who reads films on occasion for two hours a week out of the whole year, has no other program responsibilities other than clinical work during those two weeks. And we see that in some DERM programs, we see that in some other programs where there might be just one person reading slides for two weeks out of the year and that wouldn't qualify. So here's the proscriptive way, they kind of put this in so that you can go right into the system and see what, which one of these areas uh, you get credit for as your core faculty. So. Um, you, this is right on the web page too if you go to the ACGME and you can see the different areas. So just to highlight one, PubMed publications by the PubMed number. Perfect. So by faculty member. So, so each faculty isn't... member, right, you put in under each faculty member with their publication, if they have a publication. Just one criteria. It's not the only criteria by any means. You can see across this whole line here. So, so it's up to four. The number of abstracts, posters, and presentations given at international, national, or regional meetings. That's just a number, so it doesn't have to be the titles. It used to be very cumbersome to do this. You had to actually update the CV information for each faculty member. That, so it was a mu much less fun to be a coordinator in those days than it is now. So counting them is much easier than actually labeling them, titling them um, with the nomenclature that's required for... And this is where, we, you know, if societies got together and started saying we're going to have poster presentations at every single society sure. meeting, you enhance that tremendously, you know, yeah. and that's what... Um, both for residents about. and faculty, um, easily. Right, because residents and faculty both have to do this. And uh, the next thing is other presentations given, like grand rounds, invited professorships, computer-based modules, works presented in non-peer review publications. I wouldn't recommend Red Book necessarily. I don't think you get credit <laughs> for that one, but you know. Cosmopolitan. No. Cosmopolitan. Uh, yeah. Number of chapters or textbooks published. Again, this is just a number, so it's counting up per faculty member. Number of grants for which a faculty member had a leadership role. Um, so again, this is a number. Had an active leadership role, such as serving on committees or governing boards in national medical organizations or peer-reviewed journals. 
Um, and that's a yes, no. And then so the last one is really kind of where people were thinking, and it counts. Every time you give seminars, doing something like this, right? Uh, speaking organizations, didactic training, as long as it's not just within your own institution. So you can't get credit for your own grand rounds or your own um, resident you know, conferences and stuff. That's just basically expected. That doesn't count in your scholarly thing. And those are, those are kind of, it doesn't say you have to have one more than the other. You should be having at least two of these activities per year, they like to see, or every two years. Some, and the FAQs of some ROCs will tell you exactly uh, what you have to have in there every two years, for example. So, uh, and then and similar how, thing. How many faculty they expect to be? Right, what percent of your faculty, of your core faculty, have to have scholarly work as well? So not everyone has to do it. A percentage of your faculty, their core faculty, have to do it. And every ROC will have some different um, <coughs> prescriptions. So neurosurgery could be different than general surgery, could be different than vascular surgery, et cetera. I think this is where the osteopathic surgical program is really going to be at a major disadvantage because our model is based on you know, volunteer teaching faculty, not much publication. But well, that's why we're doing those posters. As you get involved in quality improvement and patient safety and a lot of those things, that's where I think, uh, and we're all struggling. I, I come from an academic medical center. When we did our assessment of our institution, one of the major areas across all programs is lack of scholarly activity. And yet we're, we're an NIH-funded kind of research center, but we all know clinical faculty, are pro they've got to do clinical productivity. So everyone in the country is struggling with this, and uh, uh, except for some very few and we, I can tell you that it's, uh, we're doing the same thing. We're making sure we go into all these regional meetings, getting our faculties uh, on board, doing that faculty development at our place. All the voluntary faculty, they're the ones coming more often than our core faculty, which is kind of interesting because this is an opportunity they never thought about before. Doing, they do quality all the time in their office and their own practice stuff, and they've never thought about putting it into a poster model and stuff like that. So. But there is credit given you know, for presentations, for giving grand rounds. You know, I think for a lot of didactic activities, um, whether or not you're a researcher. Okay. Okay. Um, let me finish. Web ads. Take a break. And then the resident scholarly activity template is almost identical to the faculty scholarly activity I, template. They don't need to get grants, you know, your residents. So. <laughs> okay. Based on the CV or something. Coordinator does it. They ask for the information, and the coordinator does all this work. Right. If the coordinator has been keeping track of who's giving conferences. Um, then there should already be a listing for the year that just ended for who gave how many grand rounds and you know whether the PGY4s are doing it in a five-year program, you know, then you can assume that each of them has you know, three or four of them a year depending on what your schedule would dictate that they have. Yes? How uh, strict are they about these abstracts and so on? Because frequently posters have you know, five names in one poster. Does that count for all of those five people or is it the first author or does it matter? It, it counts. We've been counting it, so. Yeah. <laughs> counts. It counts in my book. So far, so good. <laughs> the only thing I would say is that it's got to be searchable. It can't just be you made up some abstract and, right. you know, somebody could search it and find it somewhere, you know. Yeah. Is there a minimum number of core faculty that you need for programs? Yes, there are proscriptive core faculty that will ratios. say ratios of number of residents to faculty, and it's different for each RRC. What, is, what would it be about? Uh, some are one to one, some are two to one, some are three to one, you know, so. I'm a four to one. Uh, you mean residents to faculty? Yeah, yeah, residents to faculty. So some say you have to have a program director and one core faculty in addition to that program director. That's not an uncommon model. But at the very beginning of each of the set of program requirements, there's a job description for the program director. At the beginning of each set of program requirements, there's a job description for the program director, so the responsibilities of the program director, and then it goes right into what the faculty requirements are. So it's easy to find. And we can actually show you if you want to look at, you know, online with us during the break or, or at the end. Well, the, the thing of... Don't want to be, don't want to, I've had faculty that actually I asked them to just say, you know, to get them involved as volunteer faculty. Say, no, I don't want to be a volunteer faculty. What do you do about that? Any suggestions? Don't be residents. They don't want to be volunteer faculty. Why wouldn't they? I don't, for un, unclear reasons for me, I, I'm not sure why. We could talk at the break. And then the core faculty, it does matter to the program who you count as core faculty because they're surveyed by the ACGME. If, the, if you counted 56 core faculty, 56 faculty are filling out a survey, they may know very little about the program, the structure of the program, the requirements <coughs> of the ACGME. So um, you really want to be careful about how many core faculty you do. You definitely want to meet the minimum requirements, but um, over-subscribing your core faculty isn't really going to help. 
Right. It's not beneficial to just put names in there and there's no benefit to that whatsoever. It doesn't look better if you have more faculty than what's required. So what happens after, after you've put in all this data, they actually will go in, they review the data, and if there's anything that's non-compliant, they do issue citations without a site visit now. Um, they also relieve citations without a site visit now. So it's, a, it's good and it's not so good. So you can, um, citations are not resolved until the review committee determines it's been resolved, but they will issue two things. They'll issue citations, um, which you have to do a progress report for, and they will issue areas in need of improvement. So there's no written response required and won't have to be documented in, in web ads. But they do <coughs> issue these two kinds after a paper, after a review of your electronic submission and without a site visit. So after your program's been reviewed, um, the ACGME survey is also reviewed. It happens every spring, and we'll show you those questions. And then there can, these actions could follow the review committee looking at your data. So they might ask for clarification of information. They would ask for a progress report if they saw a, a problem that they were worried about. A focused site visit would be that they would actually come and focus on something like duty hours. So it wouldn't be a full-blown site visit, but if your pro program <coughs> has identified that it has problems in a certain area, they would come and do a focused site visit just for that area. A full site visit would be if they did find enough areas um, on the web ad submission or in some other submission like the ACGME survey that they're um, concerned about multiple areas. And then if they had potential egregious violations, they would come for a, a full site visit. Um, a story from Buffalo is that our general surgery program, when the 16 hours started, they redid their um, intern schedule to be a six day a week schedule. So they had 72 hours and um, they were very happy with their schedule. The residents went to the ACG and reported they were working 88 hours a week, every week, 88 hours. And uh, when we got a hold of the schedule, I said, well, what happens on the seventh day? And they said, well, they go back to day one of the six-day schedule. And I said, well, day one is a 16-hour day. Of course it's 88 hours. They're absolutely they're right. They're not even exaggerating. So if they work the schedule and no more uh, time or no less time, they're working 88 hours a week. So that would be something that's egregious because they, um, they actually went to the program director and he said, he's no longer the program director, he said um, to the residents, um, this is a, the duty hours are a complex mathematical algorithm that you will never understand. Um, not, I, I'm not, not a, a surgeon line. and I would be offended if somebody said that to me. Um, but I think that people can usually add X plus Y equals more or fewer than 80 hours a week. So um, when they got that answer from their program director, they actually bypassed the GME office and just went right to the ACGME. And upon investigation, they were absolutely right, 100% accurate. That, so that is a potential egregious violation. Um, and for other reasons besides that, the program ended up on probation and eventually, um, and with 21 citations, and eventually um, got off probation and has a new, a new program director. So, but that um, is the most common um, focused review is duty L violations in the surgical subspecialties. So. Um, and then they come for a focused review to make sure that they're not, um, it's not the tip of the iceberg and there aren't more problems out there. So, the focus site visit would be just to look at potential problems that they've identified during the review of annually submitted data, um, or they've seen a deterioration in performance over the years, uh, which would evaluate a complaint against the program. There would be a sole, full site visit. We're having one um, in a few weeks for a new program application that we've submitted. So new programs are still receiving full site visits. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, review committee identifies broad issues or concerns. There's actually 60 days notice given and there's a team of site visitors come to do a full site visit. But what usually happens when all is going well is that there's going to be a 10-year self-study visit. So they will most likely not come and see programs um, in more than a 10-year window. So it's not the focused or the full site visit. It's not a traditional site visit. It's actually done. The LCME accredits undergraduate allopathic medical schools using this kind of self-study model, and that's what the ACGME has adopted. So. As we said, we haven't had one yet. The first one will be a year, more than a year um, in the future. Our first one will be emergency medicine, which will be, I think, right. September of September 15, September of 2015. So um, if you call us in a year, we'll tell you exactly what it felt like to go through a, a self-study visit in a specialty that's accredited by the ACGME. So I think we're going to take a break, um, if you would like to. Do you want to keep going, or would you like to take a break? I want a break. Great. Okay. Let's take so, a 10-minute uh, break. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Can I wait now?